Chapter 15, Communication and Documentation. So this chapter covers quite a bit of information, uh, anywhere from interpersonal communication styles down to the basic equipment required for radio communications. There's a handful of items on here that you will see again on quizzes and exams, but the most important component of this chapter will be the discussion about interpersonal communications and how today's day and age of using social media, text messaging apps, and, and even video conferencing has really caused us to lose touch with the, the basic human elements of communication. So we'll talk about that in depth. Looking at uh, communication systems and the radio communication, uh, we use radios and cell phones both to communicate on a daily basis when we're doing our jobs. Uh, radios allow for us to communicate back and forth, two-way communication. Uh, One-way pagers, you'll still see some people that carry pagers that uh, will go off when a call goes out. Because it's a one-way communication device, that means we can receive communication through it, but we could not talk back through there. I'm confident that everybody listening to this is uh, very clear on how to use a cell phone, so that's really not a a concern and then the traditional telephones or landlines um, I'm sure most of you probably don't even have those at home anymore uh, you will use these from time to time at the hospital or at the fire station EMS uh, station wherever it is that you're working so looking at a radio system itself that allows us to communicate between dispatch and ourselves there's base stations mobile radios portable radios repeaters the cell phone component and telemetry and if you look at this, this graphic here, it shows that the mobile units themselves are actually attached to a vehicle. So a portable radio is one that I would carry in my hand or in my pocket. A mobile radio is actually attached to a vehicle. The main difference there, power supply. A small battery and a handheld radio does not allow that radio to transmit uh, as far or as strong as it would if the radio is a mobile radio attached to the vehicle working off the vehicle's auxiliary powder power. So from there the signal is transmitted and typically repeaters will pick up that signal, amplify the signal, and then send that on its way. The radio signals themselves only go a certain distance so we need a series of repeaters throughout the area that will continue to pick up and, and amplify that signal along. Eventually a base station will pick up that signal and that base station is typically going to be connected to either a fire station an EMS uh, station, a hospital, or a dispatch agency. So wherever the, the hub for communication is, they're going to have a base station attached along with it. The portable, I'm sorry, the, uh, the cell phones then work off a slightly different technology. While they do, for the most part, still work off of tower technology, um, there are some that work off satellites as well. And again, without getting too much in depth, what you need to know for the exam is that a mobile radio is attached to a vehicle. A portable radio is handheld, it's something that you can move along. A repeater picks up a signal, amplifies it, and retransmits it. And a base station is typically attached to a dispatch center or something like that that allows for the, the core of the communication to occur. The Federal Communications Commission, or FCC, regulates all of the communications throughout the airways. Uh, that includes both UHF, VHF, and cellular technologies. The important thing that we need to understand with the FCC is that they, they regulate things like the radio frequencies and, and everything else, but they also have some, some regulations on how we can utilize that technology. So things like profanities would not be permitted to be used over the air. So I can't be dropping the F-bomb or anything like that because all of these radio signals are scannable, meaning that other people with scanners can pick up these frequencies, they can listen in, and the last thing we want is that uh, unprofessional conduct to go over the radio. If you do use or abuse the, the radio frequencies, uh, you could be subject to fines and discipline through the Federal Communications Commission. So we got a, a large graphic here that says principles of radio communication. Uh, you can read through that. Again, this is something that uh, we're going to learn once we become employed, right? Our employer will walk us through proper radio communications. It's nothing that a PowerPoint is going to teach you. Um, but some of the important takeaways that you may see again on an exam is things like we use plain English. So if you listen to uh, police dispatchers or, or police uh, scanners, you hear them use 10 codes. So 10 4, 10 7, 10 8, 10 56, all these other items. Um, and while that works for them, for us, we use plain English. We won't use any codes. Uh, over the radio whatsoever. 
Um, beyond that, then, it's, it's pretty straightforward. You hold the button down, you wait a second, um, you speak your message, you release the button, and you wait for somebody to respond. That's about all there is to it. Having communications available is, is a, of great importance. We want to make sure that we have a portable radio with us anytime we leave the vehicle. Now, not only does this allow us to communicate with dispatch and other vehicles to request additional resources, but it's also a safety component. And within our system, uh, we have what's uh, it's essentially a code phrase. If I say over the radio, advanced life support patient, that is a distress call. And the dispatcher listening to that will recognize that they'll dispatch police and additional resources to your location. So for instance, if um, let's say that uh, I walk into a home for chest pain, I walk in, I find out it, it's an insecure area and uh, somebody's holding a gun to me. I could talk to them and say, listen, I need to radio to my dispatch center, let them know that uh, I'm gonna be here for a little while, otherwise they're gonna get concerned. So if you're able to get over the air and just say something along the lines of, you know, uh, NERCOM or CECOM from uh, 451, be advised we'll be on scene for a little bit longer treating an advanced life support patient. And by simply saying that, again, that phrase is picked up and that sends, sends all the help available over to you. Radio medical reports. So we can give uh, radio reports through an actual UHF or VHF frequency. Uh, typically, this is done through cell phone. But it is possible we use the, the radios themselves as a backup procedure if the cell phones are down for some reason. What I did is I recorded an example of a, um, of a radio report. This is just a generic report, um, but it kind of gives you an idea of the type of material or the type of information that you would include within it. So we'll take a listen here. This is Scott Woodstock Ambulance 52. We're en route to your facility with a 48 year old male complaining of chest pain. He's alert and oriented with adequate perfusion. He states that he had a sudden onset of substernal chest pain after working out. The pain radiates to his left jaw and is rated 8 on the pain scale. The patient has no cardiac history but is a diabetic. Most recent vital signs are 108 over 60, which reflects a 24 point drop after we administered one nitroglycerin, a pulse of 92 respiration is 22, and SpO2 is 96% on room air. The sugar is within normal limits. Our ETA to your facility is seven minutes. Do you have any questions or orders? So that's an example of what one radio report may sound like. Uh, radio reports are always going to be customized. There's some information that's pertinent in some cases and, and not in others. But uh, generally speaking, you want to be sure to communicate to the hospital uh, what's going on. And we call that painting a picture. So if I were to try to describe to somebody um, what I see, using my eyes, thinking about what I see currently, try to describe that through words. Um, it, it, it's truly a, um, an artistic style because it's not easy to do. Uh, we'll do some exercises in class where we try to communicate what we see through, through a verbal language. And uh, we'll see just how difficult it is. But it's something that we have to practice on a regular basis. You will we'll get better with it at time with time. So just an image of somebody using a radio in the back of the ambulance. Um, and then there's a few or recommended um, pieces of information that we would provide through that radio report. You listen to the example that I just provided. Um, there's some other you know, things that you may want to put in there also. But generally speaking, you'll see these recommendations were in line with the, the example you just listened to. So communicating with medical direction. Uh, we have the ability to call into the hospital, again, over the radio or through cell phones. Cell phone is typically our number one choice. Uh, we can call into the hospital, explain to them what's going on, ask certain questions, and they'll provide feedback or guidance on what we're expected to do. So they may direct us to administer a medication. Maybe they will uh, tell us to uh, perform a certain procedure. They could divert us to a different hospital, depending on the patient's condition. There's a lot that they could do. But it's important that we have that ability, again, to communicate back and forth, and we use them as a resource. So in the event that we don't know what to do, um, it's okay. It's our, we're not always going to know how to handle every patient. Our protocol book isn't going to cover every single situation. So we have the ability to call in the medical control at that point and get some direction from them. So the verbal report itself. Um, when we uh, get to the 
hospital and we want to transfer care over, um, we're going to give them that bedside report. We talked a little bit about that in chapter 36, but essentially what we're looking to do is, is communicate to the nurse or doctor that's assuming care for the patient everything that we have observed, everything we identified, everything we did, and any changes that we've noted. Of course, of importance would be providing the chief complaint. So, you know, hi, this is the patient. This is Sue. Uh, she's complaining of abdominal pain. Um, she says that the pain started uh, abruptly when she was sleeping. Um, she says that the pain is in her right upper quadrant, but it's not moving. It's not radiating anywhere. And she's rating it a 10 out of 10. We can provide that basic information and pertinent supporting information to the chief complaint. Um, anything that we didn't provide over the phone for our, our uh, inbound radio report, we can then provide at bedside and again reiterate any of the uh, acutely important information. So this is the, the toughest thing that I see a lot of students struggle with today. It's the interpersonal communication. Uh, we rely so heavily on text messaging and, and social media apps that um, we rarely actually engage with people. Uh, I remember when I was a kid, uh, if I wanted to talk to somebody, I either had to call them on the phone or I walked over and talked to them face to face. If I wanted to know if a friend could come out and play, I rode my bike down the street, went to my friend's house, rang the doorbell and asked him. I did not rely on my parents to send a text message to his parents and then you know, wait for a response. So we've really removed a lot of that interpersonal communication from, the, um, from our, our everyday uh, communication styles with other human beings. Well, that needs to be something that we can bring back in the back of the ambulance. When somebody calls us and they're having their worst day, we need to be able to communicate effectively with them. And that's going to portray confidence on our behalf and also allow us to be compassionate in dealing with that patient. Um, it says here, you know, speak candidly and respectfully. And that's really important. Uh, there's a, a few things that, that you need to take away from that. First of all, let's talk about the word candidly. You know, what does that mean? And I would say that candidly should should mean honestly. Um, you know, I want to speak the truth to my patient. And obviously that goes without saying that we shouldn't lie to somebody, right? But it also can speak to how we tell the truth. Um, so if somebody says, am I going to die? Well, uh, we don't know that answer, right? Uh, we may have ideas or opinions in our head, but at the end of the day, we don't know whether they are or are not going to die. So I can't truthfully say yes or no. But what I could truthfully say is, you know what, we're going to take the best care possible. You know, we're going to provide the best care for you. Um, you know, we, we've got all these medications, all these procedures. We've talked to the hospital. They're waiting for you. You know, I promise you we're going to take the best care of you at, at, at all possible. Um, respectfully. So respect means making eye contact. It means um, not talking down or being condescending to somebody. It means that we uh, generally appreciate the position that they're in, that we value the fact that they're they're probably scared, uh, that they're uncertain, and we we talk to them like we would want to be talked to, you know, if we were in their position. We talk to them like we would expect one of our family members to be talked to. Um, that may include using Mr. or Mrs. Um, it may be ma'am or sir. One thing that I hear a lot, though, that I, I really don't like is the use of hun or dear or anything like that. Our patients are not, you know, we shouldn't address them as dear or hun. It should be, you know, ma'am, sir, um, mister, missus. Uh, we can address them by first name without a doubt, uh, but it would also be appropriate to say, you know, do you mind if I call you Scott as opposed to Mr. Wessel? So those are things that uh, all lend to the respect component. And we also have to consider the demographic of the patient that we're talking to. Older patients are going to have different expectations as far as what is respectful, whereas our younger patients may feel differently. So we have to gauge our communication styles based on our patient themselves. So communication techniques. We'll talk a lot about this in class. We'll practice this time and time again in class. Some of you are uh, how we would describe or what we would describe to be an introvert just not somebody who likes to, to kind of come out of their shell, not somebody who likes to um, uh, communicate with others a whole lot. Maybe rather you would sit back and listen or observe, and that's fine. 
But when it comes to patient care, we have to communicate. We have to talk with our patients. We have to talk with our crew. We have to talk with other medical providers. There's times that we have to talk with family, law enforcement, and any other number of individuals. So communication is, is of paramount importance. And consider this. Beyond simply asking the patient questions about themselves, how are you going to communicate with the family member when you have to explain to them that their, their loved one has, dis, uh, has died? You know, if we show up to work a full arrest and you've got a, a little old lady standing there just kind of watching us work the full arrest on her husband, you know, there will come a time in your career where you have to, you know, take her aside and, and explain to her, I'm sorry, we've done everything we can. There's nothing more. Um, your husband has passed away. Your husband is dead. And there's no good way of doing it. I can't tell you this is exactly how you do it. It's dependent on the circumstance, on the situation. Uh, but what I can tell you is that no matter how good of a communicator you are, that scenario will always be complicated. So we need to work to make sure that even in the, the simple, um, easy scenarios that we communicate effectively so that when those more complex situations have come up, we're able to, to address them. Eye contact is, I can't tell you how important eye contact is. You know, I've, I've got two young boys, a four-year-old and a six-year-old. And when I talk to them or when they talk to me, I mandate that they look me in the eye. Under no circumstances can they look at the ground. Uh, can they look up in, in the air? We make eye contact whenever we talk because that is one of the most important things. It portrays that confidence and it also establishes a relationship. Uh, think about it. If somebody never makes eye contact with you, how confident do you think that they are? You know, that shows me that I think they're timid, they're scared, they're uncomfortable or nervous. And those are not the traits that I want for the person that's making decisions on how to provide care for myself or my family members. Body, uh, body language, positioning, again, things that we don't even realize that we do. Maybe it's crossing our arms, maybe it's shifting our weight. Uh, we'll talk a lot of, about this stuff in class, but uh, we need to be very much aware of how we conduct ourselves. And throughout the class, throughout the semester, expect to be critiqued on that. If you're not communicating effectively, uh, we're going to politely and respectfully explain to you how you can do better. And here's a really, really important thing to think about. This is my 10th year teaching. I've stood in front of hundreds, uh, probably, I, I bet I'm approaching a thousand students now. Um, I have worked in the fire service for quite some time. I, you know, I always felt that I was very good at communicating. Um, and then throughout my degree, uh, or throughout my, my higher education in pursuit of my degree, I took a class called Interpersonal Communication. It was offered through uh, MCC. I think it was speech 255 or something like that. But uh, it was an online speech class. I'm like, oh, this is perfect. Online speech class, you don't actually have to give speeches. I'll just do this one. So I signed up for it. Well, lo and behold, I probably should have read the course description because that's not quite what it was. Um, but it's a class about the psychology of speech, the psychology of communication. And I learned so much in that class. I mean, I, I, I sing accolades for that class every opportunity I have because there were so many things that I thought I did well and I found out in fact no <laughs> I, I sucked at communication um, and it helped me not only in the classroom not only in my career but it even helped me out at home it improved my ability to communicate with my wife arguably it improved my marriage so really consider taking that class if you're pursuing your degree or even not it will certainly help you in all facets of life now take a look at this picture here. You know, what are some good things? What are some bad things about, about it? You'll see here that the, the EMS provider, he's kneeling down. He's at eye level with the, with the patient. It looks like he's making eye contact with what I assume to be maybe the daughter or granddaughter of the patient. Um, and he's holding her hand. Now, when it comes to physical touch of our patients, this is something where we really have to look at the demographic. You know, for an elderly woman like that, she probably appreciates that, that touch, you know, that, that gentle hand on her shoulder or holding her hand in this case. Um, but if that were a 16-year-old female with that male uh, provider who looks to be probably, I don't know, let's call them 30 years old, it may not be as appropriate. It just depends. It depends on the patient, depends on what they're comfortable with, and it depends on the situation. So we really have to kind of 
uh, tweak our communication styles in, in every different circumstance. Using language that the patient can understand goes without saying. Um, you know, imagine if somebody walked up to you and started speaking a foreign language that you don't understand. How well, how comfortable are you going to be, especially if you, you are ill or injured? Uh, or how can you even give consent to somebody if you can't understand what they're saying? So what that means here is in this situation, we shouldn't be using medical terminology. We should break everything down into terms that the patient can understand. So rather than saying myocardium, I should probably refer to the heart just simply as the heart. Um, you know, I, I could tell somebody, well, we think that you are having a myocardial infarction. They'll have no idea what that means. Or I could say, it appears that you could be having a heart attack. So we want to phrase it in a way that they can understand, in a way that they can process, so that in turn, when they respond back and they, they authorize us to do something, uh, we can legally say that we obtained that expressed consent. And then honesty is, is super important. Now, this especially applies to kids. You know, if I have to start an IV on a child, the last thing I'm going to do is say, oh, it's okay, it won't hurt. Because as soon as I stick them with that needle and it hurts, they've lost all trust in me. It's better to say, listen, there's going to be a, a little bit of a poke. It'll hurt just for a second, but then it'll stop. And sometimes, you know, that the kid's going to freak out. They're not going to want to consent to the care. Um, but we still have to employ that, that level of honesty at all times. It's never okay to be dishonest with a patient or a family member for that matter. Uh, using the proper name, we kind of touched on a little bit already, listening. Oh, this is a, a big one. We need to listen. And we need to listen to understand, not listen to respond. So what's the difference there? When we listen to understand, I want to hear everything that they're saying. I want to take time to process it to really think what is it that they're trying to communicate to me. Not simply listen to the words, but try to understand the underlying meaning of the words that they're, they're speaking. From there, before I respond, I need to think about a response that actually uh, shows that I understood what they said. So if the patient says to me, yeah, I woke up in the middle of the night and I, um, you know, I had this, this sudden onset of abdominal pain and it hurts really bad. Then I should come back. Okay, so uh, when you woke up, you know, do you did you go to bed feeling like you were sick? Did you go to bed with any abdominal pain uh, after you woke up? Did anything improve? And what that does is it it picks up on what they just said, shows that I heard everything and that I was listening to them. What we see happen quite often is people aren't listening. We ask the questions because we know we should, but we don't actually listen to what the patient says. So I can say, okay, you know, hi, uh, you know, what, what's going on today? Oh, well, um, you know, I, I'm a diabetic and my blood sugar dropped. And so my, my neighbor came over and gave me a candy bar and, uh, and some Pepsi. And now I'm feeling a little bit better. But, you know, I just think that maybe I should go to the hospital and get checked out. And then the, the care provider responds back. Oh, okay. So tell me, do you have any medical history? Well, the medical history was picked up. You know, they stated that they're a diabetic in the very beginning. So it would be more appropriate to say, okay, other than your diabetes, do you have any other medical history? Or maybe we don't even need to go into history right away. Maybe we need to talk to them more about their chief complaint or the situation at hand. So again, these are all things that we'll practice and rehearse in class. But understand that you need to listen for understanding, not just ask a question so that they respond and then you can check it off your list. You need to truly understand what it is that they're trying to tell you. In this situation here, again, you notice that the care provider is down. She's at eye level with the patient there. Um, it looks like she's trying to explain to the patient what's about to happen and really getting him prepped and ultimately informed in order to get the consent in order to, to provide that care or that uh, intervention there. Compassionate and respectful, I think goes without saying. Um, not just what we say, not just our body language, but even the tone in which we say things really communicates a lot. Um, what we know is that our body language says far more than any amount of any word that we say. So even though I say something out loud, it means nothing at all. And, and think about it. You know, if your significant other, uh, mom, dad, family member, whoever, tells you that they love you, the tone in which they say it 
suggests whether or not they're telling the truth, right? So, yeah, I love you, as opposed to, hey, I really love you. You know, that, that tone, that demeanor, and ultimately the body language that goes along with it says a lot about what the patient's trying to communicate. Uh, pediatric patients, we definitely want to come down to their level. We don't want to st stand over the top of them, uh, tower over them. Uh, that's intimidating. Come down eye level, talk quietly, have a compassionate, soft-spoken voice, and again, always be honest with those kids. So here shows that the care provider came down, is holding a stuffed animal, and they're putting the, the oxygen mask on the stuffed animal first. And what that does is it shows, hey, you know, here's what we're going to do. Here's how it's going to work. This isn't going to hurt at all. And it tries to communicate a little bit more effectively. We can also assume that that arm coming in from the left side of the picture is that of a, a parent, right? Probably mom or dad sitting next to the child trying to, to calm the child a little bit as well. Our pre-hospital care report then. So the PCR is what we call it. This documents everything that we saw, everything that we did, um, and all the outcomes as a result of it. So today's day and age, we don't really have anything in the way of handwritten PCRs anymore. Everything is done digitally through a computer system. Uh, most places tend to use iPads or some other tablet now that allows us to, to input data even throughout the call instead of having to wait until the call is over. Um, your department or your agency will, will give you training on the specific technology that they use. But the important thing that we really want to understand is that we need to document everything that happened, everything that's pertinent or relevant. If we don't document it, it never happened. I'll say that again. If we don't document it, it never happened. So our PCR should uh, clearly document what it is that we found when we got there, what we observed, um, what we identified to be the problem, what we did to fix it, and any of the outcomes. You know, did the patient improve? Did they get worse? Did they stay the same? You know, what was the result of the interventions that we actually performed? It is a legal document. So that patient care report can be requested not only by the hospital staff, but it can be requested by the patient, the patient's attorney. It can be reviewed by your own internal uh, quality assurance program. Um, and it can even be projected on a, a big uh, LCD projector next to you while you're testifying in court. And I've been in that situation before. Whereas you're sitting there, your patient care report is on the screen next to you, and you've got an attorney asking you specific questions about that report. Well, you documented this. What exactly did you mean by that? You know, how come you didn't document this item? Or why did you document you know, the vitals in the way that you did? Um, it's, it's intimidating to say the least. So we want to make sure that we have a good, thorough patient care report, one that's professional. We want to make sure that we're using things like spell check and grammar check. We should have one of our crew members review the report for accuracy, identify any mistakes that we may have made. Um, I mean, these, this is a big deal. That PCR is not something that we can just kind of whip through at the end of the call. It needs to be comprehensive and be very, very detailed. It can be used for administrative purposes. So if we don't uh, document things appropriately, we could lose out on potential revenue. And although we're never in the job, you know, we don't get into EMS in order to bill people. We get into EMS to help people. But there is a cost. There is a cost to paying us to do the job. There's a cost for the supplies that we use for the patient. There's a cost for a whole lot of things. So typically we do bill for the services that we provide. And we need to make sure that we're billing appropriately. We don't want to overbill or underbill for that matter. Making sure that your PCR report is accurate, depicts everything that you did, allows for that good um, transparent billing process. We also use our PCRs for education and research. So they can download all, or rather, all of the reports get uploaded, certain fields, and then they can pull trends. They can say, okay, for every cardiac arrest that this system ran, you know, what was the percentage of people that we were able to get a pulse back? Um, what is the average response time to the scene? Uh, they can pull all this data and it allows us to do research on, on our practices, on our policies, and make tweaks. One thing that we should remember is that everything we do is based on evidence nowadays, evidence-based practices. So if, the, if our protocol says to do one thing, and after 
a hundred reports are uploaded showing that you know that procedure was followed and there's a very low success rate then it's time to look at maybe we need to change that procedure maybe we need to alter that protocol quality improvement so it allows us to go through and make sure again that that we're providing the the right level of care if uh, if my patient complains of chest pain I better document in there that I followed the acute coronary syndrome protocol that I administered aspirin nitro that I titrated oxygen as necessary that I transported to the appropriate facility and if I didn't do any of those things then I should document why you know nitroglycerin was withheld because of certain contraind contraindications or we transported to a different hospital because of inclement weather whatever the case is we need to be sure that we're documenting that as well the data elements itself uh, the NHTSA National Highway Traffic Safety Administration um, takes a lot of the data and they look at different trends and safety standards and they can put out some guidance from that as far as the run data itself goes um, we use a, a program called image trend uh, different agencies may use different programs uh, but we will be introducing image trend to you guys here and uh, walking you through the different fields and the requirements within that uh, some of the major categories within a P uh, PCR though would be things like the patient's demographics their name their address their gender date of birth those types of things and then we also have all of the information that we technically uh, or that we we add in to the report itself that provides information on what we did um, the narrative is something that allows us to kind of free write so we have lots of fields drop down boxes check boxes all sorts of stuff that we fill out throughout the PCR but the narrative is just a big open space that allows us to type anything we want to type anything that we feel is relevant and that narrative is typically used to kind of summarize all the events of the call it walks us through a storyline of of what we did when we got there um, and how that how the whole patient care experience panned out within the narrative sections we have to be careful though because we need to try to keep it as objective as possible now objective means factual that means that I can prove that this is you know it, it's black or white essentially whereas subjective is more based on opinion um, and while it is okay to have some subjective information in your PCR it should be very very limited and the focus should be on things that are objective now we'll kind of go through this and, uh, and look at some examples so looking at these think to yourself is it objective or subjective the patient is intoxicated so looking at that um, we've all been around somebody who's drunk and we can pretty much look at them and, and we can determine oh yeah they're slurring their speech there's someone around yeah they're definitely drunk but at the end of the day I can't prove that I don't know for a fact that they're drunk it could be some underlying medical condition um, it could be a, a development handicap of some sort there's any number of things that could contribute to that so I cannot objectively say that the patient is intoxicated in fact that's only my opinion that's a subjective statement so I should stay away from that what are some things that I could say in lieu of the patient is intoxicated could I document that the patient had slurred speech yep that's objective could I say the patient was unstable on their feet that they were staggering around yeah I could say that could I say that the patient smelled of alcohol absolutely could I say that the patient admitted to drinking alcohol no problem at all so by using all those objective statements anybody reading it could with common sense say well they were slurring their speech they were unstable on their feet they smelled of alcohol and they admitted to drinking alcohol they were probably drunk right but nonetheless I'm going to use only factual objective observations in my report and allow other people to come to their own conclusions so how about this one the patient is bradycardic well bradycardic means any rate 100 or below right so I'm sorry uh, 60 or below so if somebody has a heart rate of 54 then it's clear that they're bradycardic that's an objective statement that's easily defined and factual how about the patient has an altered mental status now this is a tough one right because what is altered what's normal for them what if I'm in a nursing home with a dementia patient you know is their mental status altered from normal is it altered from what we think it should be um, you know so again that that's really tough we need to be careful with that 
And this one could be subjective or objective. You know, if, if we're in that nursing home and the caregiver who knows the patient very well provides care, you know, day in and day out says, yeah, they're acting much different than they normally do. This is not their normal mental status. Then I can objectively say, yeah, they have an altered mental status. If a patient is uh, described to be normally alert and oriented times four, um, and I say, you know, where are you? You know, what's going on? And they're not able to answer those, then sure, I can objectively say that they have an altered mental status. But I have to be careful. I have to be able to identify what the baseline mental status is for that patient before I can definitively say one thing or another. So last one, the patient is having a heart attack. So again, this is kind of tough. I can identify that they're having chest pain. I can identify that the pain is described as a pressure, that it's radiating to the left arm and jaw. I can identify that they are pale, that they're diaphoretic, um, that they're short of breath, that they're experiencing numbness and tingling, that they have an irregular pulse. I can ident or identify all those objective things. But at the end of the day, while it may look like a heart attack and sound like a heart attack and probably is a heart attack, I cannot definitively prove it in the field. So that's still going to be a subjective statement. So rather, I could say the crew suspected, based on the following signs and symptoms, that the patient was having a heart attack and therefore treated the patient per the acute coronary syndrome protocol. So the narrative section, again, we should uh, restate the chief complaint, um, give some background on the chief complaint, when it started, what they were doing when it started, and then lead into the rest of our assessment and treatment plan. Included in that stuff is pertinent negatives. So I could say the patient complained of chest pain, and the pain was described as a sharpness on the left side of their chest. Okay, well, it could be a heart attack, and we want to treat heart attacks as something serious. But if they describe pain as sharp and on the left side, that doesn't really sound like a heart attack to me. So I may say, you know, the patient denied shortness of breath, denied pain radiating to the left arm or jaw, um, patient denied uh, numbness or tingling. I could put in there that their skin parameters were within normal limits. And I can kind of go through and identify everything that says that it probably isn't a heart attack. Because could they simply have a pulled muscle in their chest? Absolutely. And if they have a pulled muscle or even a, let's say, a fractured rib, um, I don't want to give them nitroglycerin or aspirin for those situations. It wouldn't be appropriate. So simply, we, we need to identify what we believe is wrong with the patient, what our treatment plan is, and we need to sometimes prove why we don't think that it's something else. And those would be our pertinent negatives. Uh, within the narrative section, we want to use, again, normal English, proper grammar, spelling. Um, we want to be sure that we're uh, not using radio codes or abbreviations that aren't uh, medically accepted. And the back of our protocol book has a list of accepted abbreviations or acronyms that we use. Um, if it's not in the back of that protocol book, you're not allowed to use it in any type of documentation. Special documentation issues then. So confidentiality. Uh, that patient care report must be kept confidential. Everything is, is uh, um, encrypted online. You know, you have to use passwords to get in. When you're done typing a report, you need to take care to, to actually sign out to make sure you don't accidentally leave something up on the screen. Um, and we need to make sure that we're just staying within the, uh, the confines of the HIPAA Act. Um, patient refusals. So these things here, ooh, those are high liability. Uh, a patient is in need of medical care, and for whatever reason, they choose not to to go to the hospital or not to allow you to uh, to treat them. Um, that is their right to do so. However, we need to really document that we went out of our way to explain to them the risks, that they clearly understood the risks, and that when they made the decision to refuse care, they were fully informed. Case in point, uh, I went to a house one time for a an elderly woman who was complaining of chest pain. Um, we got there, we did the assessment. She was very cooperative. She was talking to us. You know, she told us what was wrong. Um, she allowed us to do the EKG. EKG comes back and lo and behold, she's having a heart attack. There's, there's no denying it. So we start prepping the cot and I said, all right, ma'am, we're going to help you get up and, and we're going to get you over to the cot and get you out to the ambulance. And she says, no. 
She said, no, I don't, I don't want to go to the hospital. I said, but ma'am, you're having a heart attack. You, you need to go to the hospital. No. And I think it was a Thursday, and her, uh, her grandchild was scheduled to graduate high school on Saturday. So she said, no, I, I'm not going to the hospital. I'm going to be there to watch my grandson or granddaughter graduate on Saturday. I said, ma'am, you're having a heart attack. If you don't go to the hospital, there's a good chance that you could die, and you're not going to make it to graduation on Saturday. And she adamantly refused. Um, and it wasn't until uh, I, I even got the doctor on the phone. The doctor explained to her what the risks were. Ma'am, you need to come to the hospital. She said, no, no, no. Eventually, she signed the refusal. I did a, an incredible job of documenting everything that we did to try to convince her otherwise. Um, and that was it. She, re she signed the refusal. She ended up calling back later on, and, and a different crew took her in. Um, but nonetheless, you know, we need to really make sure that if you know she would have died an hour later, that it doesn't come back on us as being negligent. You know, well, you didn't tell her that you know she was having a heart attack, or you didn't tell her that if she didn't go to the hospital, she could die. You know, we need to document all of those things, all of those warning signs. Uh, falsification. Obviously, we'd never want to uh, falsify anything. If we make a mistake. We make a mistake. We have to own it. Uh, more than likely, if you make a mistake and, and you admit to it, um, there's going to be a learning experience. There may be a little bit of fallout from it. Probably not the end of the world. If you make a mistake and you cover it up and you get caught, uh, you're probably going to get fired and you're going to open yourself up to lawsuits. So anytime we, we make a mistake, um, an error, an omission, whatever, we just correct it. We don't try to hide it from anybody. We follow the proper channels and we do it um, in a way that avoids any future uh, trouble or liability. All right, so moving on then. Um, think about it. Uh, let's go on to this part here. Special situations. So multiple casualty incidents. Um, different EMS protocols allow for different uh, documentation or patient care reporting um, based on the situation. If it's a true mass casualty incident, um, there's a good chance that you're probably not going to have to do a patient care report for everybody just because there's no way to effectively organize everything and, and keep track of you know exactly who you cared for and everything that you did. It's, uh, it's kind of organized chaos in those circumstances. Um, beyond that then, uh, there are other reporting requirements that you have to adhere to. Uh, if there's an exposure, something to an infectious disease of any, uh, of any kind, you need to report that. There's a procedure where you have to go through your, your medical officer, you have to report it to the hospital, your department and a few other things. Um, anytime there's an injury that needs to be appropriately documented and then don't forget also that you are a mandated reporter. So if you identify suspicious uh, signs of abuse, uh, neglect, uh, sexual assault, violent situations, any of those things, you have to document that stuff and you have to report it to the appropriate uh, facility and in addition to that you have to document that you reported it. Okay, And that's really it. Um, chapter 15 is something that we're going to really dwell on a lot in class. That interpersonal communication thing is huge. Uh, I really would encourage you to kind of get away from the text messages and just go out of your way to start talking to people. As a matter of fact, I'll challenge you this. As you walk down the hallway at the college next time and you walk past a perfect stranger, look them in the eye, smile at them and say, hi, how are you? Rather than pretending like they don't exist. Rather than looking the other way or, or avoiding that eye contact. And just really be observant. You know, how many people can you actually communicate with effectively in the hallway? And how many people lack interpersonal communication? How many people do their best to avoid communicating with you? Okay, uh, so that was chapter 15. As always, if you have questions, hit up one of your instructors. Thanks a lot for listening.